Good afternoon. Come on, give me some more energy than that. Good afternoon, right? It is a privilege to be in front of all of you today. And thank you, Brian and Ewan from AppNexus and everyone for inviting me here. It's an, it's an honor and all of you look amazing. But I wanna start with something first. How many of you all have ever been asked to make the business case for diversity and inclusion, right? You all have been asked that, or you've been told that you have to make this case for diversity and inclusion. Well, I want you all to rid yourself of that today. Now, we're here to talk about the male role in inclusion, but I want to start with that, right? Because what is the business case for diversity and inclusion really asking you? It's a tax. It is a tax that, that women, folks of color, folks who are differently abled, LGBT folks have to actually pay in order to be allowed to be in someone else's space. And there's a labor associated with trying to convince someone else who has a biased opinion of you that you have value. That's what the business case is really saying at bottom. Like, what is your value to my organization? Can you give me data on that? And then I'll let you in, right? Now, the business case is also saying, women, prove to me that everything that I believe about you is not true, and then I'll let you in this space. It's also saying, women, prove to me that you're capable of making my business more profitable, and then I'll let you in this space. That's what the business case is really asking at bottom. Well, we're going to rid ourselves of the business case today. But I can tell some of you don't really believe me, right? So let's compare the business case to the women's suffrage movement, right? So back in the days when women didn't have the right to vote, they would say certain things about women, about why they didn't deserve the right to vote. They would say things like, well, women just don't have the desire to vote. In the business world, they say things like, women actually don't run and run businesses. They would also say things like, women will be corrupted by politics and chivalry will die out if you have the right to vote. In the business world, they say things like, women just are mentally strong enough to run businesses. Are you convinced yet? They also say things like, women's place is in the home. That's why you don't want to vote. What do they say in the corporate world right now? They say, well, at some point she's going to want to have a baby. That's why I'm not going to promote her. Doesn't those two things sound very, very similar? Lastly, men would actually say that you're just too inferior for the right to actually vote. Or they would say things like, you know, you want to work in the corporate space where you're too emotional, you're too irrational, right? So are you convinced yet that we have to rid ourselves of having to prove to anyone else that we have value? But I think that James Baldwin said it best. I want to read this one perfectly for you all. He said, one cannot defend oneself against somebody who's determined to prove to himself, not to you, that you are inferior. And he wants you to corroborate it. We've got to walk out of that nightmare. We've got to walk out of the nightmare of having to prove to someone else that we have value, that you have to have data or some analytics to prove that you deserve to be in this space. So let's rid ourselves today of the need to make the business case. And the next time someone asks you, what's the business case? Say, ask James Baldwin. <laughs> the next thing I want you all to do is rid yourself of the belief that it's only the job of women to fight for gender equality in the workplace. Men need to start showing up. Because you all have done everything that we asked of you. You got your mentors. You got your executive sponsors. You got your ERG groups. We've asked you to do so much to prove that you deserve to be in our space. Right? Haven't, isn't that time over to rid ourselves of having to do all of this actual work? So what's the role of men? What's the role of men? in all of this. The first role for men is to give up this idea that I'm a good guy, right? How many people say, well, I'm a good guy. I'm not involved in the sexism that you all face. I'm a good guy. As if you women are handing out like scorecards saying, you got a five, so you're done today, right? 
Like, no, it's not like, well, I got a 7.5, so I'm good, right? Because as long as we men think of ourselves as good guys, that's all that we think we have to do. That's all that we think we, is that I'm done now. I'm a good guy. You said I was a good guy. I'm done now, right? There's more work that we have to do. My good friend, Michael Denzel Smith said, when your self-conception is centered on the idea of your own goodness, it prevents you from hearing any critique of your own ideology and behavior. Because how many times has a guy said, well, I'm not as bad as he is, but what are you actually doing to change this culture? What are you actually doing to change the culture? Men have to understand that the corporate world was set up by men for men. As Gloria Steinem says, women are not looking to integrate this old system. Women are actually looking to rebuild and transform this entire system. And we men have to be a part of that. Women did not create, as Brittany Cooper says, this zero-sum calculus that, that if women start to join the workforce, that men lose out. That's just not the case. The second thing we men have to do is we have to educate ourselves about what your lives in the corporate world are actually like. That when you take a, pater- a parental leave, it's considered a luxury. But we have to know that you all are punished for that. That you all are miss out on opportunities because someone actually believes that it's a luxury that you get to take time off. We men have to educate ourselves and do the work to understand what your lived experiences are really like. We've got to understand that ideas like executive presence was created with a man in mind, so you all will never have the perfect executive presence. So we dock you and say, you know what? You don't have executive presence. We as men have to educate ourselves to make sure that we are doing the work daily to understand what your lived experiences are like so we can get rid of this idea that I'm a good guy. Then we got to make it personal. We got to make it, it's got to live here. How many times have you heard some guy say, well, I had a baby, I had a daughter, and now I've become a gender justice advocate. That's benevolent sexism. Right? Oh, pat me on the back now. Actually, no. You should have been doing this anyway. You didn't need to have a daughter or have a wife. You should do this because you're human and you believe in fairness and justice. And you have to know that we as men benefit every day from a system that was set up for us to succeed. We have to start doing some work. We have to start doing a lot of work. It has got to be personal then we got to act, right? Like we can't just talk about all these things. Like we have to actually act. We've got to understand that when we go out to work for drinks after work and there are no women there and we're talking about work, that we're intentionally not allowing you to be a part of the work that is done where people build networks and have certain types of connections. We've got to understand that there are consequences to our actions. And we say things like, well, I didn't intend to do that. Forget the intention. What about the impact? What about the impact that this has on your careers? We've got to understand that there is a lot of work to do, and we've got to move to action every single day. A friend of mine, Juan, said that men should be on one-day contracts for our feminism. And, And that means even men like me. That every day I have to sign a new contract that says, oh, you were good on Monday, but what what are you going to do on Tuesday? You were great on Wednesday, but what are you doing to make the lives of individuals who don't have access to power and privilege today? My feminism is on life support because I fall short, too. I I was asked to partner with with our first lady of New York City um, on an initiative for LGBT equality. And I got off the phone, and I was so excited, and I called up my team, and I was like, oh, my God, the mayor's wife just called me. And she said, who? I said, the mayor's wife. She said, I'm going to ask you again, who? I said, ah, the first lady of New York City, Charlene McQuarrie, right? Even me should be on a one-day contract, right? That every day I have got to be actively involved in educating myself, to understand that your lives are very different from mine and that I am actively 
complicit if I'm not actually doing work to make the lives that you all have better. I want to close with a quote by a friend of mine, Gloria Steinem. She says, it's about making the life more fair for women everywhere. It's not about the rebuilding the existing pie. It's about making a new pie. That's important because oftentimes we ask women to take on certain characteristics that were historically ascribed to men. That's not okay. That's not okay. We should want you all to transform and rebuild this entire system. And what inclusion really means is that you're valued, you're respected, you not just have a seat at the table, but you actually have power to make decisions when you're at that actual table. And you get to decide who's at the table, too. Again, it's not about adding you all to the pie. It's about making an entirely new pie. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.